Hello, hello. Good morning. I'd like to encourage everybody to find a seat, please. Settle in for today's program. Delighted to see all of you. A lot of friendly faces out there. A lot of students. Uh, great. So I'm Steve Slick. I'm the director of the university's intelligence studies project. So on behalf of our team, as well as the Strauss Center for International Security and Law and the Clemens Center for National Security, welcome to this year's National Security Career Fair. I should also note that our partners in this fair each year include the Texas Career Engagement and the LBJ School of Public Affairs. We appreciate all the folks across campus who contribute to successful events like this one. So this is the fourth iteration of our National Security Career Fair, and over the years we've received a great deal of feedback, positive feedback, from participating students and employers. We're thrilled when students report back to us during the year about internships and job offers that result in the impacts they made here at this fair. We're very proud of our students and excited when they choose to pursue careers in public service, foreign affairs, and national security. They're a well-prepared, patriotic, and diverse collection of future leaders. It's our daily privilege to teach, counsel, and prepare them and help as they prepare to help keep the nation safe. So today we're hosting more than 20 employers from both public and private sectors. I hope you had a chance to interact with them outside. We appreciate their interest in our students and thank each of them for participating. So if you'll bear with me, I want to acknowledge and recognize the employers who came out today to meet with our students. The Air Force Office of Special Investigations, UT Austin's Applied Research Lab, Army DevCom Analysis Center, Crumpton Global, the Defense Intelligence Agency, Deloitte, the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Intelligence and Analysis, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Los Alamos National Lab, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, National Reconnaissance Office, National Security Agency, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and the National Counterterrorism Center, the Office of Naval Intelligence, Rain Risk Intelligence Network, Sandia National Lab, Texas Army National Guard, the State of Texas Department of Public Safety, their Intelligence and Counterterrorism Division, UT Austin's ROTC programs, the Army Judge Advocate General's Corps, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and finally, last but not least, the U.S. Department of State. So we understand for our students that you may have to come and go a bit during the program to meet with the employers and also get to your classes on time. The employers will be available until 3 p.m., so students should be able to join the program, enjoy lunch, and apply for a job before heading home for the day. <laughs> so here's a preview of today's program. Under the broad title of The War in Ukraine, On the Battlefield, In the Kremlin, and in the courtroom. When I step down, the Strauss Center's director, Adam Klein, will introduce our keynote speaker on the challenge of investigating Russian war crimes as part of Ukraine's quest for justice. When Ambassador Williamson wraps up, you'll be invited to stretch your legs, claim a box lunch in the rear of the auditorium, and enjoy the fellowship of our faculty, staff, and students, along with your neighbors. And then about 12.45 or so, uh, Paul Edgar, who's currently serving as the interim director of the Clements Center, will restore order to the room, introduce a panel of experts that's been asked to address Russia's war in Ukraine with two timely questions. Where does it stand today, and how will it end? Ambassador Williamson and our experts have each agreed to field your questions, so when that time comes, please be prepared to participate in the discussion. Adam. Thank you, Steve. Thank you to the Intelligence Studies Project, which we are proud to be a co-sponsor of. And I especially want to thank the staff members of the Intelligence Studies Project, the Strauss Center, and the Clement Center, and everyone else who's helping with the event today. It takes a ton of work to bring this together with the number of employers and the great speakers we have for you. Uh, and we really appreciate it. And I know that all the students who are benefiting from this appreciated it well, as well. We find ourselves in the middle of the largest conventional war in Europe, since World War II, with casualty counts that are already staggering and rising each day just on the military side. But we also see daily attacks on civilian infrastructure in Ukraine, 
And after the revelations in Bucha, near Pin, and other locations in Ukraine, we saw clear evidence of atrocities directed against civilians, which brought to mind some of the other tragic and grisly atrocities in places like Bosnia and other places around the world that we've seen in the last 30 years. We're very lucky today to have one of the world's, and that's not an exaggeration, foremost experts on investigating these type of war crimes. And let me read you some of the highlights from his bio, which I think will substantiate without doubt that claim. Ambassador Clint Williamson currently serves as the lead coordinator of the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group for Ukraine, which is jointly funded by the United States, the European Union, and the United Kingdom. Uh, and that is in his capacity as Senior Director for International Justice at Georgetown University. He also holds an appointment from the International Court of Justice to conduct arbitration for a tribunal related to atrocities committed in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which are still being investigated the, all these decades later. Previously, he served as the lead prosecutor for a special investigative task force investigating atrocity crimes committed in the aftermath of and during the 1999 war in Kosovo. He also coordinated diplomatic policy and operational support for the UN for the Khmer Rouge tribu Tribunal in Cambodia. During the Bush administration from 2006 to 2009, he served as the U.S. Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues. During that tenure, he also helped let lead U.S. diplomatic efforts to transfer detainees from Guantanamo. Before that, he served on the National Security Council staff at the White House, served as a senior advisor to the Ministry of Justice in Iraq after the invasion in 2003, uh, and, and before that, uh, served in Kosovo, helping administer the prosecutorial and judicial systems um, in, after the separation of Kosovo, the de facto separation of Kosovo from Serbia in 2001 to 2002. Previously, he served as a trial attorney at, I think it's fair to say, one of the most successful inter international war crimes tribunals, the International Criminal Tribunal in Yugoslavia, known as the ICTY, where many of the most important precedents on war crimes and accountability for war crimes uh, were created, precedents that still predominate in international law on these issues today. He also authored indictments against no less than Slobodan Milosevic, which was the first head of state ever indicted by an international tribunal for war crimes. Uh, before that, all the way back to domestic law, being a domestic law prosecutor here in the United States, he served as a federal prosecutor in the organized crime and racketeering section of the U.S. Department of Justice, and perhaps his toughest assignment as an assistant district attorney investigating and prosecuting murders in New Orleans. So for our law students here, and I'm, a, I'm on the law faculty, for those of you who don't know, this is a great example of how real, real hard lawyering skills earned uh, in the domestic legal context can translate into a fascinating career internationally. He's a graduate, he's a native of New Orleans and a graduation of the Tulane University School of Law and Louisiana Tech University. Ambassador Williamson, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Adam, for the, the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, have this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, also good to see some former colleagues like Steve Slick, with whom I served at the National Security Council during the Bush administration. I'd like to begin by offering some remarks on the work in which I'm engaged in Ukraine. But as Steve mentioned earlier, I do want to leave time at the end for questions, and I look forward to a good back and forth dialogue then. As Adam mentioned, I've had a lot of experience during my career as a prosecutor at, at the state, federal, and international levels, as a policy official, and as a diplomat. So I want to approach our discussion on Ukraine today from those different perspectives, explaining how the prosecutorial, diplomatic, and policy equities are interconnected, and how that dynamic translates into what's happening on the ground in Kyiv. But first of all, I'll start with how I became in Ukraine, became involved in Ukraine currently. In summer 2021, my former office, uh, which is now called the Office of Global Criminal Justice, the State Department, and I'll refer to it by its acronym GCJ, uh, they reached out to me and asked if I could put together a team of people who could work on an initiative to advance accountability for atrocity crimes 
in both Ukraine and South Sudan. That may seem like a mismatch, uh, and my first reaction is, do I choose one or the other? Uh, but they said, no, we, we want you to do both. And um, the, the common thread between them is that they're both high priorities for the State Department. Beyond that, there weren't a lot of, of things that were in common. But in both places, they needed capacity building to help them with their ability to investigate and prosecute war crimes. But secondly, there was a need for a diplomatic push to try to get the governments to move forward on, uh, on, on doing something more on accountability. And because of my mix of prosecutorial and diplomatic backgrounds, I was asked to, to do this. As to Ukraine, I had been in Kyiv in 2017, uh, previously, on a visit focused primarily on a regional anti-corruption initiative. At that time, I had met with Masha Yovanovitch, who was the, the U.S. ambassador, and just as, as an old friend, we were talking, and she knew my background, of course, on, on dealing with, with war crimes. And she had talked, even at that point, about what she saw as an inertia in the Ukrainian government on dealing with crimes that had been committed since the Russian invasion in 2014 and the occupation of territories in the eastern part of the country. At that point, I just gave her my advice on what I thought the embassy might do, but thought that was the end of it. I did stay attentive to events on the ground in Ukraine, but I wasn't engaged in a significant way again until 2021 when the State Department had contacted me. But as they requested, I did put together a team of people primarily focused on capacity building, working in gov with governments in both Juba in South Sudan and Kyiv to help them. And we officially started at the end of 2021. By January of 2022, it was becoming quite clear that a Russian invasion of Ukraine was, was imminent. And up until that point, we had not been able to do a lot of work on this project in either South Sudan or Ukraine because of the security situation and also because COVID was rampant in, in both places. As a result, we had a largely untapped pot of money available. And I suggested to the State Department that we use this and pivot from the capacity building exercise that we had envisaged to a much more operational, hands-on collaboration with the Ukrainians in the event that the Russians did invade. The State Department agreed and we started making plans uh, along those lines. During this period, I was in regular contact with the Ukrainian Prosecutor General and her senior staff. All of them were quite sanguine about the prospects of a Russian invasion, saying they'd been living with this Russian threat forever, this was all bluster, they, you know, Russia was not going to invade. At the same time, everything I was seeing from the State Department and in a Russia working group I participated in with former ambassadors to Ukraine, Russia, and Georgia, and former senior military officers, all the evidence was that an invasion was a certainty. On the morning of February 23rd, 2022, I was at home in Washington and woke up to a number of text messages from the Prosecutor General, uh, Irina Venediktova, asking if we could speak urgently. So I ended up getting on a Zoom call around 7 o'clock in the morning Washington time, and she was there with her senior staff. As I said a moment ago, the Ukrainians had been very relaxed about the prospects of an invasion. But on this morning, it was clearly different. Their hands were shaking, their faces were ashen, they were keenly aware of what was about to happen. Venediktova asked me if I could come to Ukraine as soon as possible and in bed with her office, and as she said, show us how to do this, knowing that they were about to face this huge onslaught. I told her I would see what I could do, but I was aware that the embassy had already relocated from Kyiv to Lviv, and I knew it would be very difficult for me to go to Kyiv. I immediately went to the State Department that morning, started working on what we could possibly do. Uh, we started making plans. Then the next day, February 24th, as I'm sure you know, Russia did invade from the east, coming from Russia proper and territories it had occupied in Donbas, and then from the north, sending troops south out of Belarus. When that happened, I lost contact with Venedicta Werner's staff. For three days, did not hear anything. They then reemerged in Lviv, and she again repeated a request, asked if I could come, and I said, look, I can't go to, to Ukraine, but I can come to Poland. And she said, that's fine. I'll send people over to work with you there. So I left Washington on March 3rd, one week exactly after the invasion, flew to Warsaw, and we went with a small team 
to a village called Krasichin, which is on the border with, with Ukraine. We arrived on March 4th. The next day, a small group from the office of the prosecutor crossed over the border and met with us there. The men in the group had had problems crossing the border. Already at that point, Ukraine had put a moratorium on any men between the ages of 18 and 60 leaving the country. Although they were on an official delegation, they still had trouble getting through. I knew from past experience that the competence levels in the Office of the Prosecutor General, and I'll use its acronym, the OPG, uh, were quite high. They knew how to investigate and prosecute crimes. But there are a number of specialized approaches and skills that are necessary when you're dealing with atrocity crimes, not to mention the scale of what we all knew they were about to confront. So the first recommendation I made when we started talking was that they needed to make contingency plans, where they one, if necessary, how to secure files, how to make sure that sensitive witnesses and their staff were protected. The reaction I got from every one of them around the table, we don't need to do that. Kiev's not going to fall. This is a point, one week in, Kiev is completely surrounded. I think everyone in Western intelligence and military circles felt like it was just a matter of days before Kiev collapsed. But they were absolutely convinced that that wasn't going to happen. And it's the spirit that has driven them throughout this whole period. And I think it goes a long way to explaining how they've been so successful in defending their country. I stress the need for restructuring the office for wartime operations, for prioritizing cases, explain why this was critical. I emphasized how important it was early on to work with intelligence agencies, the Ukrainian intelligence agencies, to retain information that they were gathering, explaining that they needed to make sure that intelligence information that was gathered for operational purposes, for example, information of Russian deployments in a certain area Ukraine was defending, that this information was retained when those operational needs had been satisfied. And I'll come back to why this was necessary in a moment. They had a lot of specific requests for us, and we then worked with them on just a whole wide range of issues. What types of interviews they should be conducting with internally displaced persons, with refugees, with women or men who had been victims of sexual violence. How to question and how to handle prisoners of war. Uh, just a whole wide range of issues. So we talked about all of these things, and then shortly thereafter started churning out recommendation papers on this with guidelines, which the prosecutor general just adopted verbatim, had translated into Ukrainian, and distributed as to prosecutors. We also provided advice on strategic creating a military analysis capability. Now, why is this so critical? This is one of the most significant distinctions between investigations of common crimes and war crimes. As I said, Ukrainians were quite proficient at investigations and prosecutions of the former, as are most countries with competent law enforcement capabilities. These cases tend to be more straightforward. This is what I was doing in New Orleans as, as a homicide prosecutor. These are the kind of things where, you know, A shoots B and C is a witness. Or there's other clear evidence of who the perpetrator is and what ties him or her to the crime. In atrocity crimes cases, it's very difficult, often impossible, to identify individual perpetrators, the trigger pullers. Military units move into an area. The soldiers in the unit are unknown to the local population. They commit crimes, and then they move on. So military analysis becomes critical. The intelligence information that I was telling them from day one, you need to make sure you're holding on to this, because you need to determine which military unit was in a given place at a given time. Who were the division, brigade, battalion, company, and even platoon commanders? How did the command structure operate? How much leeway was given to field level officers or NCOs? What was the role of the unit in the broader operation? All of this information allows you to put cases together and to apportion responsibility up the chain of command, eventually to senior military and political levels in Moscow. The first part of investigating atrocity crimes is closely akin to what prosecutors do all the time, although the scale is vastly different. But the gather gathering of evidence that a certain crime was committed in a given place at a given time is relatively standard, what we refer to as crime-based evidence. The second part, which is fairly unique to atrocity crimes, but also has parallels in organized crime investigations, 
is what we refer to as linkage evidence, this linkage of crimes up the chain of command. So we were working with Ukrainians on all of this within a week and a half of the invasion, helping them get their investigative and prosecutorial agencies positioned to investigate and prosecute these crimes at the same time as their country is defending itself against an existential invasion. This is something which is unprecedented. At the point that I had the first meeting with the Ukrainians in March, on March 5th, they already had identified around 300 atrocity crimes cases that they were working on. The number today is around 100,000. That number is certain, almost certainly not entirely accurate. There will be duplications in reporting, cases that aren't really war crimes, errors in case tracking, but the overall number will still be significant, clearly in the tens of thousands. So what types of crimes are we seeing in Ukraine? From the very beginning, there were clear evidence of war crimes, grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. So things like disproportionate use of force, unlawful targeting of civilian facilities, crimes that are committed from a distance by a military force that ju just lobs shells at whatever target it selects, are not even at a select target, but without regard for who and what gets destroyed in the process. This has continued to the present time. The Russian military makes very limited or no effort whatsoever to comply with its obligations under the laws of war, something which is inculcated into NATO militaries. By the end of March 2022, we began seeing a different category of crimes. It was first revealed, as Adam mentioned, when areas that had been under Russian occupation outside Kyiv were liberated by Ukrainian forces. In particular, Bucha and Irpin, two middle-class suburbs of Kyiv, where many of the people were government civil servants or military or police employees, were hit hard. Russian security forces were going around with names, knocking on doors, looking for specific people, pulling them out, taking them to interrogation centers, torturing them, and then murdering them. Large numbers of people were found with their hands tied, blindfolds on, shot in courtyards, alleyways, dumped behind bushes, and then eventually into a mass grave. There were large numbers of summary executions of people, sexual assaults, other atrocities, the detentions, the tortures, all of this kind of much more personalized manifestation of crimes which began to constitute crimes against humanity, crimes of a widespread or systematic nature targeting civilian populations. As prosecutors from the Kyiv region had to deal with these scenarios, this is the point where I first saw them overwhelmed, and understandably so. Even in North America or Western Europe, imagine how challenging it would be for investigators and prosecutors to deal with crime scenes that go on continuously for miles and miles, where you have hundreds of murder victims, each body having to be treated as a separate and distinct crime scene, hundreds or thousands more surviving victims who might have been raped, tortured, illegally detained, had their homes destroyed. This would be overwhelming for any prosecutorial service in the world to cope with. I've been in a number of situations like this in past conflicts, but I was always there as an outsider, and as emotionally taxing as these situations were, I always had some distance from them and the luxury of a foreign passport. Think about how difficult it is when these people are your neighbors, your friends, when your own house might have been destroyed, but they have persevered and continue to, uh, to investigate these crimes doing a phenomenal job under these circumstances. Earlier, I mentioned the role of military analysis and how one takes an investigation up the chain of command. Butch is a perfect example. Through analysis early on, the Ukrainians were able to determine that the primary unit in Bucha was the 64th Guards Motor Rifle Brigade. I won't go into the specifics of the process, but the evidence of their role was overwhelming. So you take this information, and then you go up the chain of command to the division level, the core level, and so on, with the op objective, as I mentioned, of creating linkages between events on the ground, the crime-based evidence, and those ultimately responsible at senior military or political level. Often, those linkages are very difficult to establish because senior leaders generally try to put distance between themselves and those units involved in the crimes. The opposite has actually been true in Russia, and Bucha is a case in point. In what is a prosecutor's dream, you had Putin commending the 64th Brigade for their performance in Bucha and actually awarding medals to their commanders and soldiers for the defense of the motherland. Instead of the deniability that leaders usually seek, 
Putin and other senior Russians are openly embracing the actions which are clearly criminal. When you have a situation like this, it certainly helps from a prosecutorial perspective to build your linkage evidence not just from the ground up, but from senior most levels in the government down. Likewise, many of the statements that have come from Putin and others in Moscow help make the case for a genocide prosecution in Ukraine. I don't think we're at the point of saying categorically one way or another that a genocide is underway. But the evidence of intent continues to grow, and that's the critical element. While genocide is most often associated with the Holocaust and the murders of six million Jews in Europe, there's no numerical threshold for what constitutes genocide. Instead, it is based on the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, ethnic religious, or racial group through certain acts such as killing. What we've heard from Putin and others repeatedly is that Ukraine is not a real country. Its people do not have a national identity separate from Russia, and that Moscow's intent is to end what they contend is this fiction of a state. As a matter of policy, Russia has certainly engaged in actions that corroborate this intent, such as forced assimilation of populations in territories they occupy, and most chillingly, the abduction and attempts to russify thousands of Ukrainian children. The killings of people that they perceive to be loyal to the Ukrainian state, identified through filtration processes, and so on. We are, of course, very attentive to what the Russians are saying in their public statements, what we can learn of their policy discussions behind closed doors, and tracking how their actions on the ground correlate with what they're saying. All of this feeds into a determination of whether or not a genocide is occurring and whether there's sufficient evidence to charge Russian leaders with that crime. The last remaining category of crimes under international humanitarian law is the crime of aggression. But I'll hold off on speaking about that for a moment, as it features in what I want to say about policy perspectives in Ukraine. Ultimately, though, all of the talk that goes on about categorizing these crimes is largely semantic. The distinction between crimes against humanity and genocide is perhaps not that significant. Both entail the deaths and suffering of far too many people. The distinction is certainly more relevant in political discussions and understandably for victims in terms of characterizing what has happened to them. From a prosecutorial perspective, though, it should be solely about amassing the evidence and then determining what the appropriate charging vehicle is, no matter what the political pressures are. But that's not always the case. For the Ukrainians, they feel that it's very important to charge genocide and crime of aggression because they think those charges encapsulate the totality of what is happening to them. And under the circumstances, that's perfectly understandable. I've discussed the nature of the crimes with which we're dealing, but this is all academic unless we have a means to prosecute these cases. In Ukraine, we currently have two primary vehicles for accountability. The International Criminal Court, the ICC, and the Ukrainian domestic justice system. Everything I've discussed thus far has been in the context of our work with the OPG, and thus the role of the national justice system. The ICC, however, does have jurisdiction in Ukraine, has been quite active with its investigations and preparations for prosecutions. In fact, I met the ICC Chief Prosecutor Karim Khan on that very first trip to Poland right after the invasion, about a week after he had, we had arrived. He was already going into Ukraine at a point when the U.S. would not allow me to do so. As you may have seen, the ICC has already issued arrest warrants in two cases related to Ukraine. These are the equivalents of indictments in our system. One of these is public, and the other is under seal. But the public indictment charges Vladimir Putin and Maria Lvova Belova for crimes related to the unlawful deportation and transfer of children from Ukraine to Russia. Lvova Belova, the Orwellian title of Russian Commissioner for Children's Rights, has been one of the leading executors of Putin's policy of separating Ukrainian children from their families and forcibly russifying them generally through adoptions by Russian families far from Ukraine. These are still early days, and I'm certain there will be additional ICC indictments issued, but the ICC's role in Ukraine will be limited. As a court with global jurisdiction, the ICC is already dealing with 16 other situations around the world, and historically, they've never indicted more than five or six people in any given situation. Even if they triple that number in Ukraine, we're still probably talking somewhere around 15 to 20 prosecutions. Ideally, those will be of the most senior Russian officials, people like Putin, Foreign Minister Lavrov, Defense Minister Shoigu, and top Russian generals. And that's hugely important, but still just the tip of the iceberg. 
When you're talking about 100,000 crimes, you're talking about thousands and thousands of perpetrators. Obviously, not all of them will be identified. But everyone under that very top level of the Russian leadership that is left, who can be identified and evidence can be secured, will need to be prosecuted in the Ukrainian domestic system. And that's why our efforts are focused primarily on assisting them. Our support effort has expanded pretty significantly since I took the small team to Poland in March 2022. But it has remained true to the same concept I employed then. Basically, our approach is to get prosecutors, investigators, and analysts who have extensive experience working in international war crimes tribunals or domestic systems where they dealt with large numbers of crimes, places like Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina. As I mentioned, the Ukrainians' capabilities for investigating and prosecuting the cases are quite high, where they need assistance in the specialized work related to atrocity crimes. So we have a roster of experts who rotate in and out of Ukraine. Most can't stay there full time, but they are making sacrifices and spending extensive periods of time on the ground. I go every six weeks and am there for about 10 days. But day in, day out, we're working hand in hand with our Ukrainian counterparts. Ultimately, though, the question is, where does all this lead? The reality is that in the near term, at least, very few Russian defendants will be brought physically to trial. Ukraine does allow for trials in absentia, but the OPG is conscious of not overusing that tool and will utilize it only in selective cases. Ukrainians do have some low-level perpetrators in custody, but most of these individuals are conscript soldiers who might have committed a single murder or sexual assault. But almost all of the commanders they've identified, those going up the chain of command until you reach the top levels of leadership, remain out of, the reach, out of reach for the Ukrainians. So to some, this may seem like a wasted exercise. Having indictments in place, however, does serve a purpose, a number of purposes, actually. Although it seems unlikely anytime soon, we could see a shift at some point to a more rule of law oriented government in Russia. They would either be willing to extradite some perpetrators for trial or more likely would be willing to prosecute some in Russia based on Ukrainian indictments. This may seem far fetched, but as Adam mentioned, I led the investigation and authored the indictment against Slobodan Milosevic, the then president of Serbia for crimes in Kosovo war in 1999. At that point, nobody gave us any prospect of getting him into custody. He was still in office as president. A year later, though, he was overthrown, and a year after that, Serbia extradited him to The Hague. So sometimes circumstances can change in unexpected ways. But even if Russia remains an autocratic, hostile state, unwilling to deal in any way with the crimes its officials and soldiers have committed, which seems more likely, indictments make it very difficult for people like Putin or Lavrov to operate on the world stage in the way they once did. It reinforces their pariah status. For them or anyone else who is under indictment, it becomes very difficult to travel for fear that they will be detained on an Interpol red notice and sent to Ukraine for trial or prosecuted in The Hague by the ICC. We already saw Putin's reluctance to go to the BRICS summit in South Africa, something in the past he would have never missed. And finally, the indictments do, uh, sorry, indictments also bolster the case for maintaining sanctions on individuals who have been charged and on the governments that continue to harbor them. And finally, the indictments do help tell the story of what happened in the conflict. They provide a record of the crimes that were committed, the victims who have been impacted. And as we saw with so many Nazi camp guards caught in the US or elsewhere decades after they committed their crimes, the indictments remain in place, always hanging over their heads, leaving open the door to some sort of eventual reckoning. So this is an overview of what we're doing from a prosecutorial perspective. I'd like to now touch briefly on the diplomatic perspectives to all of this. The initial response in March 2022 to assist the Ukrainians when I went to Poland was a US-only effort, although many on my team were from other countries. Over the course of April and May, we continued to operate out of Poland. And then in June, we shifted our ground operations to Ukraine itself and have worked out of Kyiv since that time. As we were working in Poland in spring 2022, though, I started developing plans for what our ground operation would look like, consisting primarily of these groups of experts that I mentioned a moment ago. We were then contacted by, the, the State Department was contacted by the European Union saying, we would like to also join in this. And shortly after that, the United Kingdom approached the State Department and said, we would like to be part of that as well. 
the different governments were sponsoring various implementing organizations who were executing the, these missions on the ground. So the three governments formed this, this coalition. I was appointed as the lead coordinator of this, overseeing this consortium on the ground of five implementing entities, but also serving as the, the focal point between those organizations and the governments that effectively serve as a board of directors. This initiative was designated the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group, or ACA. The Ukrainians refer to it as ACA, and I'm used to saying that, so I'll use that abbreviated form as well. But ACA was formally launched in a statement by Secretary of State Blinken, EU High Representative Joseph Burrell, and then UK Foreign Secretary Liz Truss on May 25, 2022. What is significant about this is this was an unprecedented approach to dealing with an ongoing global crisis. Never before had three major governments joined together to sponsor a non-governmental rule of law mass atrocity response effort on this scale or of this nature. But the diplomatic and political rationale behind it is interesting. First and foremost, it reflects the fact that the U.S. and its allies have tried very hard to maintain a united front against Russia in every military and political sphere. In an area as sensitive as the investigation and prosecution of crimes, reaching back to top levels in the Kremlin, the governments wanted to make sure they were speaking with one voice and that their assistance was closely coordinated. Secondly, this approach was a reflection of how challenging it has become to respond to crises through the more traditional means utilized in the past, primarily the UN Security Council. Of course, with Russia as a permanent five member of the Council, any sort of resolution there would have been impossible. But even in places like Syria, Myanmar, Sri Lanka in recent years, it has become more and more difficult to get agreement on peace interventions or accountability processes. Also, within regional organizations like the EU, there have been problematic actors like Hungary. So by doing this as a jointly sponsored diplomatic initiative, but implemented by non-governmental actors, it has provided a new model for responding to crises. If we are successful in Ukraine, I think you'll see this approach used again in the future, because it does provide a means of circumventing the impasses in multinational decision making that have become so routine. I'd like to shift now to the last perspective, and that's the policy angle on accountability, and talk about two issues that feature prominently here, at least from the U.S. perspective. The first of these is the International Criminal Court, the ICC, which I already mentioned briefly. The situation in Ukraine is fairly unique from an accountability perspective because you have both viable international and domestic mechanisms for pursuing justice. The more common scenario is what we've seen in most conflicts in recent years, in places like Syria and Myanmar, where you have neither. The countries are neither state parties to the ICC, or you could not secure uh, support in the UN Security Council for referrals to the ICC because Russia and China block them. Likewise, no domestic justice process could work in these countries because gov the governments themselves were complicit in crimes. Ukraine is different because the country is a signatory to the Rome Treaty, the ICC Treaty, and has invited the ICC to exercise jurisdiction. Thus, there is a viable international mechanism available. At the same time, Ukraine is a democratic country with reasonably well-functioning and a capable national justice system that has both the legal mandate and wherewithal to investigate and prosecute crimes. As a result, Ukraine is perhaps the best manifestation of what was intended for the operation of the ICC, that it would function within a concept of complementarity. What complementarity means in practice is that the first and preferred avenue for accountability would always be a domestic justice system. If that's not feasible, then some sort of internationally assisted or hybrid process would be the next option, and the last option would be a fully internationalized process with the ICC. These various actors in an ideal world complement themselves, thus complementarity, to deliver justice and ensure that the most egregious perpetrators don't escape with impunity. This was the concept behind the ICC that the U.S. was most comfortable with at the outset, one that ensures that considerations of national sovereignty are respected, unless there are no other options, and that the ICC operates in tandem with national processes when those domestic capabilities are viable. The fact that this is possible in Ukraine has made it much easier for the U.S. to be fully supportive of the ICC's work there, and for us to even have bipartisan legislation in Congress 
that facilitates full U.S. cooperation with the court on Ukraine. With the exception of the Trump administration in the first term of the George W. Bush administration, every other presidential administration since the advent of the ICC has pursued a pragmatic approach to the court. And I'm sure here, given the level of political support for Ukraine, that would have been the case as well. But the fact that the ICC's role in Ukraine has tracked very exactly with how the U.S. wanted the court to operate in the first place, it has made it much easier to get the bipartisan support we've witnessed for its work in Ukraine. It also explains from a policy perspective why the U.S. and our EU and U.K. allies have been so supportive of what we're doing through ACA. We're helping ensure that the domestic component of this complementarity formula is working well, and that between the ICC and the Ukrainian justice system, we're able to bring to bear all the tools at our disposal. The Ukrainians, however, would like to see another tool in the mix, and that's a special tribunal for the crime of aggression. I briefly mentioned crime of aggression earlier and said I'd come back to it in the policy context. The theory of crime of aggression was first articulated during the Nuremberg trial, and it was used as a vehicle for prosecuting the Nazi leadership on the basis that every other crime committed by the Nazis flowed from their decision to wage aggressive war all across Europe, i.e., the crime of aggression was the root of everything else and provided the platform for all other crimes they perpetrated. Although the theory of crime of aggression was developed by American prosecutors at Nuremberg, the U.S. has become much more wary of its use in the U.S. and its inclusion in the ICC statute and potential use without some Security Council review was one of the major concerns that led the U.S. to pull out of the ICC process. Because of the, all, all of the controversy associated with the crime of aggression, they couldn't even reach uh, agreement on a definition for it in the statute, and this had to be kicked down the road for several years before they were able to do so. But when it was actually, when it was eventually added, there were various restrictions that were put on it. Without going into detail on those, suffice it to say it cannot be used by the ICC in the context of Ukraine. Likewise, the crime of aggression cannot be prosecuted domestically in Ukraine because of head of state and senior off official immunity that would bar Ukraine from prosecuting these senior most Russians. So Ukraine has sought a creation of a special tribunal for this purpose, and a number of countries have gotten behind this initiative, including most of our EU partners. For now, the U.S. has gotten behind an incremental process that has started with establishment of a special prosecutor's office to collect and retain evidence and to see where this leads, and then to take this, as, as I said, incrementally and see if the U.S. can eventually support it. This is a bit of a compromise inside the U.S. government crafted to be supportive of Ukraine, but also to assuage concerns of certain elements within the government, particularly the Department of Defense, that is still very wary of crime of aggression prosecutions. The bottom line is that virtually everyone in the U.S. government believes that Russia has waged an unprovoked, unjustified war of aggression against Ukraine and should be held accountable for their actions. But as always, the implications for the U.S. of pursuing accountability in one fashion or another will influence the government's policy decisions in what the U.S. will support or not. This is not unique to the U.S. Other countries do the same. But because U.S. global equities are so extensive and the U.S.'s role is so far-reaching, our decisions often have a more pronounced impact and therefore acquire more prominence. Thus, even the lukewarm backing that the U.S. has shown for the Crime of Aggression Tribunal has been quite impactful because it indicates a willingness by the U.S. to show much more flexibility on an issue that had previously been a completely closed book. The fact that this has happened and that you've had strong bipartisan majority in Congress pass legislation to empower the ICC in its work on Ukraine is indicative of how important Ukraine's fate is to policymakers. The flexibility the U.S. has shown on Ukraine is frankly unprecedented, but I think the approach has been very pragmatic and has been one that will ultimately advance accountability in Ukraine. The reason I've touched on the diplomatic and policy imperatives at play here is to underline the fact that international justice cannot be separated entirely from politics. As much as we would all like to see justice function independently of such concerns, whenever you're operating in an international context with geopolitical equities at stake, justice and politics will be inexorably entwined. The challenge then is to try to ensure that you keep the politics sufficiently at bay so that they don't undermine what you're trying to achieve in terms of justice. This is particularly challenging when a global power is involved. A criticism I had to address many times during my tenure as ambassador when I would speak to audiences 
They would often call out what they saw as U.S. hypocrisy on international justice issues. Many times their arguments had some validity, and I would acknowledge them, but try to put things in context as to why the U.S. was doing things in a certain way. A point that I would always make in closing was that international justice is far from perfect. It's not universal, and it's not equitably applied between strong nations and weak ones. Yet when you look at how far we've come in the 30 years since the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia was created, marking the start of this modern era of international justice, it's truly phenomenal. No one at that time imagined that ICTY would ever produce any significant results. Most people's expectations that we would instead try a few low-level camp guards and then just fade away. Instead, what we have seen over the last 30 years are heads of state like Slobodan Milosevic, Charles Taylor, Isan Abre, Saddam Hussein, Omar al-Bashir, being, being held to account for their crimes. Justice is still far from perfect, but this progression over such a short time frame, the blink of an eye in terms of legal history, is remarkable. We do still have a long way to go before international justice is universal and equitable, but holding the leadership of Russia accountable for their crimes in Ukraine would be a huge step in that direction. It would show that there are certain lines that even the most powerful countries cannot cross, such as utilizing mass murder, abductions of children, forced deportations of civilian population as tools of policy without having to bear responsibility. And if we can do that, it would be progress indeed. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions you might have. Right, over here. I think we have microphones coming around. So, yeah, it's me. Hold on. Yes, sir. You mentioned, of course, uh, international justice and politics. So how do you respond to the fact that the U.S. invasion of Iraq, of course, was also a violation of international law? You mentioned, of course, earlier that uh, Putin didn't go to BRICS this year. Well, of course, there are many countries that George, George W. Bush doesn't also visit now because of these things. So. And, and, you know, honestly, even in, in the situation you're dealing with now with the Russia-Ukrainian war, I mean, we're on the side of what's left of the Azov Battalion and Rice Sector. Certainly they commit war crimes as well. So I guess, I mean, it sounds like we have made a lot of progress, like you're mentioning, in the last 30 years. But, I mean, Putin himself mentioned many times how the U.S. invaded Iraq and also there were war, war crimes in Afghanistan. So how, you know, again, this gets back to the whole idea of politics being very involved in international justice. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Look, I, the, I, I think when, when you look back at, at Iraq, and I, I went to Iraq right after the invasion, I had huge misgivings about, about the in, invasion. But I was part of the group that went in right after that. Um, it was clearly going to happen. And I wanted to make sure that the United States government was as successful as they could be in the implementation of, of this policy. Whether you agree with the rationale or not that led to, to the invasion, the performance of, of U.S. troops on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan as well, largely, almost in, universally, was consistent with the laws of war. There were crimes that were committed. But in Iraq and in Afghanistan, I, I don't remember the exact figures. It's been a long time since I sort of was, was focused on this. But I want to say in, in Ukraine, you had over 120 American soldiers who were prosecuted in the U.S. military justice system for crimes that were committed there, including seeking the death penalty against some of them for crimes that they committed against Iraqis. You saw the same thing in, in Afghanistan. We are a country that is based on rule of law. We have a functioning military justice system, a robust civilian justice system. We have a free press. We have a parliament, a Congress that investigates 
crimes and puts in place a degree of, of accountability. Um, you know, does this always go up the chain of command entirely? No. I mean, if some people may have felt that President Bush should have, have faced charges for, for decisions that he made, but the fact is, and, and I would always say this about Slobodan Milosevic, you know, the, this prosecution that we did for his crimes in Kosovo, had the Serbian military held its soldiers accountable for the crimes that they were committing on the ground there, the crimes would have come to a stop. And it certainly would not have gone up to the level of the president of the country to be held accountable. But when you have political leaders, military leaders, who are giving carte blanche to their forces to commit crimes like this, and in fact awarding them medals for doing so, it puts it in a different, different character. And so I think that you, know, you, you have to look at it from, from that perspective. Uh, had Russia conducted this, this invasion and largely abided by the rules of war, whether you agreed with their rationale for going in or not, had they done that, had they not executed civilians, had they not you know, destroyed buildings with just this indiscriminate fire, had they not abducted children, there would probably be much, much less enthusiasm for any prosecutions against Russia. But the fact that they have totally thrown the laws of war out the window and operated in a way that is entirely criminal, that is what has subjected them, I think, to these, these prosecutions. I heard you. I can maybe repeat the, the question a little Should bit. Should I start again? again? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm happy to hear that again. Thank you. Okay. So, okay. Next. Um, yeah. uh, my suspicion, or my, I suppose that we have the, uh, uh, your work is being supported by the current administration. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say that we States, uh, had a new president who was very friendly to Russia. Uh, your work now has resulted in an impetus that conceivably would not have occurred without the support of our current administration. Let's say the next administration, friendly to Russia, says cease and desist. Mm -hmm. What are the possibilities that your work will be weakened or could continue? Um, we're, look, we're, we're operating with an imprimatur from the U.S. government, the U.K. government, the EU, and, and funding to do this. This is an expensive undertaking. Uh, we have people going back and forth to Ukraine. We're, uh, you know, we're having to pay them their, uh, not salaries, but kind of expert fees, uh, which are not exorbitant. I mean, they're, they're actually much less than what people normally get to do this type of work, but people are very interested in doing it. But it adds up. I mean, you've got this many people. They're getting hazard pay. We have to pay insurance for them to operate in a war zone, which is incredibly expensive. We have to buy armored vehicles to, to move about in, in the country. Uh, you know, it, it is a costly in, endeavor. And Congress has been uh, putting this money forward. It's going to the State Department. It enjoys incredible bipartisan support in, in Congress. I don't see that, that changing. I think you have some members of Congress on both the left and the right who are, who are opposed to this, but the vast majority of, of members are very, very supportive. Um, but ultimately, it, the, the money goes to, to the State Department to administer this. So if you have a president who is hostile to this, the instructions can go down to the State Department, we're not going to continue this, and without that, that vehicle, there's really no way for us to do this with governmental support. I'm convinced you would still have a large civil society initiative to, to help Ukraine in, in this regard. But I, I think 
U.S. leadership on this issue has been critical to getting the European unanimity in support as well. I, I spent three years working in, in the European Union as, as a prosecutor. I was on secondment, on detail from the U.S. government there, so I was formally assigned to the U.S. mission to the European Union, but working substantively in, in the EU. And I know how difficult it is to get political consensus in, in the union. Um, and I, I just don't think it would have happened here without, without U.S. leadership. So I think not only would you see a diminishing impact, clearly, of, of the U.S.'s role, but I think that this would have a clear follow-on effect with, uh, with our European partners. Yes, thank you for your brilliant presentation. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, my question is about uh, evidence that would be used uh, to prosecute war crimes. And several months ago, I believe it was a New York Times documentary or something in the newspaper that had some video uh, supporting it about war crimes in Bucha. I believe mm -hmm. it was in Bucha. To me, that was pretty impressive in terms of the depth um, of uh, investigation that was reported in terms of naming units involved, na of these military units, naming names of leaders of those, mm -hmm. of those units. So and my question is, uh, to what extent does the organizations that you're representing use open source media uh, investigatory work for mm -hmm. evidence? And if so, how can that be parlayed in a more positive way to get more evidence? Yeah, it, it is a huge asset. Um, and when I, when I first started doing work on atrocity crimes, it was while the war in Yugoslavia was ongoing. You know, this was in, I, I started there in 1994. Um, at that point in time, we had virtually no open source information that, that we could use. Uh, the, the best thing we would get would be intercepted or you know, downloaded television broadcasts that were being done by Radio Television Serbia that the Croats or the Bosnians were, you know, were recording. And sometimes they would say incriminatory things there. They would have video that might be useful. Uh, if you got any sort of civilian video footage or anything, it was from those old clunky you know, VHS cameras. Uh, so there was not much of that. Satellite imagery, we, we had to get from governments, because at that point in time, that was the only source of, of that information. Uh, now, where everyone has a smartphone, you know, you have literally thousands of pseudo-investigators who are out there recording things, um, giving you the kind of information, exactly what you're talking about, of what, these, what military units might be involved. Before that, we had to just go back and question witnesses. You know, what kind of uniform were, were these soldiers wearing? What were the colors of it? What sort of insignia was on there? Uh, what, uh, were they speaking with any sort of accent? Anything that would help you to identify who the units were. And now a lot of times you're getting this information through, through this open source material. With satellite imagery, now sometimes you can go to governments and you can ask them for certain things that might pinpoint something that occurred, but then you can go to commercial firms because all you know, commercial satellite imagery is readily available. So all of this is out there, uh, but it is a blessing and a curse. The blessing is you have so much, the curse is you have so much. Uh, it's you know, parsing through this, trying to find out what is accurate, what has not been perhaps doctored, uh, gets to be overwhelming. And so one of the big things we've been working on um, is, is trying to help the, the Ukrainians with their capability for registering, you know, indexing, uh, archiving all of this material and going through and analyzing it, trying to determine what is useful, what, what can, can, uh, can actually be used in court. The reality is that relatively little of it can be used in court, uh, but a lot of it is very helpful for lead information that you can go out and you can pursue other things. So it, is, it has been a huge game changer from the time when I first started with this in the, in the early 1990s.
Given the role of the Wagner Wagner Group, uh, mm -hmm. is there anything especially novel, and are, are there practical or legal difficulties that will arise in prosecuting crimes that they have committed, and in particular tying those back to uh, Russian higher command? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Wagner Group is certainly a, of great interest, and they have been involved in, in a lot of atrocities. So it, it's a big focus for the Ukrainians. Um, it, it has been a big focus for the International Criminal Court. Um, I, I think it would have been a matter of time before Prigozhin had been indicted by the ICC had, had he not survived his unfortunate accidental plane explosion. Uh, so, um, you know, they, they're, they're definitely in the crosshairs. The, the phenomenon of the, of, of the Wagner group and these paramilitary groups is it, not new. Uh, we, we saw a lot of this go on in, in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, there was a, a guy named Jelko Reznatovich, uh, who was known, his nom de guerre was Archon, who did sort of the same thing. He started out, he was the president of the fan club of Red Star Belgrade, uh, a soccer club. And yeah, I mean, people laugh. People think, you know, that, that's kind of funny. But the thing is, is these soccer hooligans were, I mean, these were, you know, violent criminals. And the government knew this. And so they basically, the security services in Serbia, put him in charge of this fan club for that specific purpose. And, and that's it. And I mean, they count on the fact that people are kind of like, yeah, you know, but, but that's, the, that's the reality of it. And he also did the same thing, went and pulled people out of prisons to go and, and fight. And um, so we ended up prosecuting Archon. He also died an untimely death. Um, before he, he was brought to trial. But the, the difficulty there, when you get into these, these paramilitary groups, what it, from, from a prosecutorial perspective, what is challenging is these organizations do not have the, um, you know, coherent sort of regulations, chain of command, uh, policies that you find with regular military forces. So you're not able to go back and say, all right, you know, if this guy did this, then this person bears responsibility because they had clear command on it. It's all much more amorphous. And so that's the difficulty of, of prosecuting up the chain of command in these groups. I think people that are in the very clear top leadership still will likely be prosecuted. Um, and the Ukrainians are, um, you know, very, very intent on, on holding Wagner uh, accountable. And, and I think the, the evidence that is being gathered is already pretty substantial in, in that regard. Okay. Yes. Uh, hello, sir. Hi. So, I have a question regarding current events, uh, events that have uh, been re well revealed recently. Uh, so recently it has been revealed that uh, there were certain Starlink services that were uh, turned off for the Ukrainian offensive on Crimea against the Russian Navy. Um, uh, as we know, this was uh, allowed by the government. The government allowed uh, Starlink services to be set up in Ukraine uh, to provide service and signal to Ukrainian soldiers. And uh, the deactivation of these services by um, Elon Musk uh, allowed for the Ukrainian drones to not be able to hit their targets and float harmlessly into the water. Um, is there any particular repercussion that this would have for, uh, I would say, uh, for SpaceX, since the government agreed with SpaceX to, um, you know, uh, give mm -hmm. uh, aid to Ukraine in the form of these Starlink systems? And also, uh, slightly related to the previous question, um, what was your uh, administration or your organization's reaction to the Wagner Rebellion uh, that took place a few months ago, where they almost reached the gates of Moscow? Yeah. Um, so on, on the issue with, with Elon Musk um, and you know, the, the way that they handled this, it, it's clearly not a criminal matter. Um, it's, you know, there's, there's no kind of criminal prosecution that, that could arise from that. 
Um, I don't know what the implications will be from a policy perspective. Um, with, with the agreements that are in place with SpaceX, if this was some sort of violation of that, if there would be monetary damages that are there, clearly it, it would be something I think that would undermine levels of trust, um, might impact future policy decisions related to the use of SpaceX, but I, I, I think it'd be hard for me to comment beyond that. Um, on the, on the, the Wagner Group, I'm sorry, what was the question on, um, oh, on the, the uprising against, against Putin. Um, you know, this was, I, I, nobody knew what to make of this uh, initially. I was with a group of, of Ukrainians at that time in, in Brussels. I, I was with the prosecutor general. We were sitting there with, with other top officials, including some intelligence officials from, from the Ukrainian government. Um, and they just weren't sure what, what was happening initially. Uh, I, I think they, they came to the conclusion that in the end, both of them, both Putin and Prigozhin, kind of panicked a, a little bit as, as this progressed. Putin clearly was unnerved by how far the Wagner rebels were, had, had traveled, how close they were getting to Moscow and had to be having questions about the reliability of, of his troops. I, I think he was probably pretty confident that by the time they got to Moscow, they could be dealt with. But still, this was unnerving and it was unsettling the, the longer this went on. I think Prigozhin also started thinking, okay, this has been very successful up until this point, but at, at what point is this gonna turn ugly and, and maybe end badly for him? And you know, ultimately, they both found it in their mutual interest to to negotiate an end to this. You have to think that Putin clearly had in his mind, I'll deal with this at a later time, and, and clearly it looks like he did. Uh, but you know, by all accounts, this seemed to be what it appeared. I mean, that this was a rebellion. You know, was it Prigozhin thinking that he had enough support that he could maybe overthrow Putin and take power? Or was he trying to displace the military leadership? I think it's hard to say. We, we may never know. Steve. And you may have a better analysis of that than I do. So. Changing subjects. Thanks very much. Man. This has been terrific, just as we expected. Thanks Thank for you. coming to join us. Um, I had a question on the purposes for undertaking these investigations and ultimately prosecutions, if you're able. You described a good bit about accountability being an objective worth pursuing. I'm interested in deterrence. Mm -hmm. in this case, and whether you've seen any evidence of your work and, and the work being done to draw attention to war crimes and gather evidence of potentially prosecutable war crimes, whether that's yet had any impact on Russian decision making. Mm -hmm. is, is something not happening because of concern about your work and in general being mm -hmm. held uh, internationally or domestically accountable for these uh, heinous acts? It's a good question, and it, it, it's difficult to answer. Um, you know, we, we have seen isolated cases of Russians, largely through intercepted communications that the Ukrainians have, have collected, where some officers, uh, and I, I think even at, at lower levels, like some conscript soldiers, who have objected to committing crimes but it's been few and, and far between. It's hard to tell whether that has been driven from self-interest, that now they're worried about the possible criminal implications for them, or if they're doing it just out of a moral, ethical perspective. Um, I, maybe it's easier for me going back to, to look at the, my, my work in, in former Yugoslavia, because I was there for seven years, and saw and this, this whole continuum between while the war was still waging in Bosnia and Croatia all the way to the, to the war in Kosovo. What I saw was not really that prosecutions had had a huge deterrent effect, but that the result was the way that Serb forces behaved in Bosnia and in Croatia in the period between 1991 and 1995 differed from the way that they behaved in Kosovo in 1999. 
they went to much greater efforts to cover their tracks where they were committing crimes. So they were incinerating bodies. They, they were disinterring mass graves and taking the bodies to, to Serbia. They were trying to get out of the reach of international investigators and, and prosecutors. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would refer to that as deterrence, but, but it was clearly evidence that there was an impact, that they were aware of, of this. Um, and I think we've, we've seen this in, in other scenarios where, you know, discussions have, have taken place um, that I'm probably not privy to get into, into details about, but, but certainly from intelligence information that has been gathered where concerns have been raised in other governments, not Russia, in other parts of the world, particularly in some scenarios in Africa, where people have expressed concerns about prosecutions. So I think, you know, slowly it, it, it has an impact, but it really goes back to the point that I closed with that until this is more universal, um, it, it's going to be hard to have a true deterrent effect. I, I think when, when criminal justice is applied sporadically, when there's not the assurance that it is forthcoming, it, it, it's hard to have much of a deterrent effect. And I think for most Russians, they're still quite confident that they're never going to have to bear responsibility for their crimes. So, okay. I'm sorry, there was, yeah, back here, you, yes. You raise your hand earlier, so I didn't get to you. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ambassador. I was wondering if you could offer any thoughts on the idea of amnesty or protection from prosecution being part of a brokered peace agreement between the two warring parties. Mm -hmm. Could that or should that even be considered either by the Western powers backing Ukraine or by the Ukrainians themselves? Well, uh, good question. The Ukrainians categorically reject that. And President Zelensky has repeatedly said that not only is a military victory uh, critical, but holding the Russians accountable for their actions is, is equally important. So I think it would be very hard for the the Ukrainians to, to sign on to that because he has been so categorical uh, about it. Uh, I, I don't think that it will be, I don't think that there will be much impetus for, for doing that. The, when, when we indicted Milosevic in 99, we did this as the war was still ongoing in, in Kosovo. So 52 days in, into the conflict. The immediate reaction from, from the media and you know, from, from critics around the world is, oh, the ICTY is doing this at the bidding of U.S. and NATO. In fact, the U.S. government, who was detailing me to the ICTY, was furious, as were NATO. They were saying, you know, this is going to impede ceasefire negotiations. In fact, I think it had, and, but, uh, you know, I, I think it actually had the opposite effect. I think when the indictment was issued, it, and what we subsequently learned from, from insider witnesses, is that it really shook up Milosevic, and he felt like, okay, I've got to end this before things get out of control, and I end up getting arrested somehow and shipped off to, to be prosecuted. Uh, so he, he ended the war very quickly thereafter. I'm not saying that was the decisive factor, but just to make the point that I don't think that it impeded the, the peace process. And I think with, with Russia, it's just going to be very difficult for, for that to happen. Now that you have indictments in place, from the ICC with Putin. I think other indictments will be forthcoming with other senior figures. Uh, th those are there. there. There's no means of, there's no ability of the international community to negotiate an amnesty that is binding on the International Criminal Court. So it would still be up to individual countries whether they would respect an amnesty that had been issued or whether they would abide by the indictment that, that would be done. And uh, so I, I just don't see that as, as really a realistic possibility, but I'm sure that that will factor into discussions and uh, will, you know, will arise when eventually some sort of peace talks emerge. The, the other point that just triggered something in my mind that I had not mentioned is one of the things that we are also working with the Ukrainians on is their obligation to prosecute Ukrainians who commit war crimes. So the very first meeting that I had with the Ukrainian delegation on March 5th, 
2022, they acknowledged this without prompting from me. They said, we know we have to police our own. And I think that they have done a reasonably good job of that. At the very least, they're, they're conscious of the fact that right now they have the moral high ground, and they don't want to lose that. Uh, where there have been instances of, of Ukrainian troops who have committed crimes, they have launched investigations. So in theory, they're, they're quite committed to this. The difficulty is, is actually in putting people, Ukrainian soldiers, on trial. If you don't have a lot of Russians that, that are in custody, and the Russians have committed 95% of the crimes, and you don't have anybody you can put on trial, but then you're putting on trial a Ukrainian soldier who's committed a crime, the public reaction is going to be toxic. So, you know, prosecutors are aware of this. They're aware of the political dynamic that is there, but they are investigating these crimes as they're occurring. Um, disciplinary action has been taken by the Ukrainian military, and um, I, and so I'm, I'm confident that they will, will abide by their obligations in, in that regard. Okay. Okay. Yes? Just let me know when we need to stop. Okay. I think this will be the last question. All right. Okay. I'll make it short. So okay. uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Very important. Um, I worked with Masha Yovanovitch for several years ah. uh, in Kiev, Ukraine, and really appreciated her work there. Uh, at that time, under her leadership, we worked very closely with the NIS states, all of them. With, I'm sorry? The uh, newly independent states. NIS, okay, sorry, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't hear you. And, and I watched how we also operated uh, with, uh, for example, during the Iraq War, same time, in Ukraine with uh, working with Poles and with the Ukrainian soldiers and getting their commitments on what they're going to be doing in Iraq as well. So this mm -hmm. leads me to this thought process of do you ever try to engage outside of the EU, the newly independent states, in terms of what's being, what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, we, we have not. Um, you know, right now, and, and I think in large part, it's, I, I think they all feel that they're in a very difficult position there between a rock and a hard place. Of course, Russia is, is leaning on them to uh, stay, you know, quote unquote loyal to, to Moscow. Uh, a lot of them are hedging their bets. Certainly countries like Kazakhstan are becoming closer to China. Um, and you know, not kind of putting all their eggs in, in the Russia basket, so to speak. Um, but we are, so we, we have not really engaged them. I, I, I think there's a recognition that this would be such a sensitive topic for, for most of those governments. Um, and, you know, even like, like Hungary with Viktor Orban, who has been quite supportive of, of Putin, um, he has kind of looked the other way where, where the EU is, is doing this. He, he's tried to avoid taking a stand on it. He hasn't blocked things, but at the same time, he, he's certainly not, not supportive of it. Um, and others, maybe less so with, within the EU, a small, small minority. And so with them, we're just we're really not engaging very much. One of the things that we are looking to do, though, and... Uh, I'll give you a preview of something we're, we're rolling out officially in Brussels on October 16th, is announcing, it, it's really being described as, as a funding vehicle, a multinational fund to support the work of ACA, the work that we're doing in, in Ukraine. And it serves two purposes. One of them is to kind of broaden the pool of financial support between the US, the EU, and UK. And there are other countries like Canada, Individual EU member states like Germany, uh, Denmark, and others, the Netherlands, they want to give money to this. So that we're building up uh, a financial base that will be sustainable even when interest in national parliaments wane for, for supporting this. And, you know, that's inevitable. So sooner or later, U.S. Congress, other parliaments are going to say, look, we've, we've given enough, we, that's it. So we want to provide that financial foundation for sustainability. The other big goal of this, and, and there have been models for this in the past, is 
to allow other countries to contribute to this. So, for example, you might have Costa Rica, which is saying, we would like to give $20,000. You know, the U.S. is giving $10 million or $20 million. Uh, the EU is giving $18 million. So $20,000 isn't a huge difference. But having another country, having Costa Rica listed as one of the donors is important. It will then be up to each of those countries whether they publicize how much they're contributing or not. But part of this is an effort to try to counter the, the Russian narrative, and I think which probably goes to the, the heart of your point, that you know, this is a North American, Western European exercise against them, and that the rest of the world is with them, particularly the global south. And in fact, that's not the case. I mean, there, there are lots of varying views in the global south. They're, they're certainly not all unified in support for, for Russia. And many of these countries have voiced a willingness to, to contribute, to help with this. So we see this as a vehicle, as I said, for financial stability over the long term, but also for trying to bring in a broader pool of governments and really show the international nature of, of this coalition that is very supportive of, of accountability and very critical of Russia's actions in, in Ukraine. Okay, great. Thank you, Ambassador Williamson, for those powerful comments. Thank you.